2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. See if this reminds us. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. So we talked about what? Paul's thorn in the flesh. What was that thorn in the flesh? We found out it was what? It was more than likely, based upon previous verses that we go back in the Old Testament, we found out what a thorn in the side and, and th stuff like that. It was people... They came against what Paul was doing. What were they trying to do? Get him to stop preaching that message, right? Try to get you to change the message. Hey, that's not really working for you. Attack the messenger or discourage or discredit the messenger, right? And so how is it that Satan does that? Well, we talked about um, how he works, this course of the world works through people to do those things, tries to get us to change the message, they attack us personally, or they try to discourage or discredit, right? Now, that, that's one of those things, the discourage and discredit. The discredit thing, uh, it, comes, it comes sometimes from outside, right? Uh, when I, over here at the school, the old principal that we had, what he would do is he would discredit me to all the students, so none of the students would, able, would ever come around and talk to me about the Bible because he discredited me to those students. So there was about a three or four year period of time where I couldn't talk to kids because, well, you just don't know what you're talking about because our principal says that you don't know what you're talking about. And it is what it is, all right? And so then I would find that discouraging because I would miss out on opportunities to be able to talk to people. But those are the things that we see that it's a group of people that were going around and possibly even one person going around following Paul to do those three things. Get him to change the message, to attack the messenger, or to discourage or discredit him. I mean, you look at the end of his life and he says what? All they that are in Asia have left me. And so then you get to think, wouldn't it be nice, so we've got a capacity of 79 people in this room. Wouldn't it be nice to have 79 people in this room? Sure. But would it, all, would it be nice to have 76 of them uh, trying to ruin what we're doing? No. So then you've got to think, okay, the more people you have, the more problems you're going to have. And the more 
ideas that they bring in try to what? Discourage, discredit, and, and mess up all that stuff from within. Not just without, but within as well. Uh, so you've got all those things you have to think about. But here's the issue, and this is where we come down to. So we're going to read verse 8 and 9 and then get going. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. For this thing, the thorn in the flesh that Paul is talking about, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your word. And as we take a look at the struggles and strife and life that we have here on this earth, may we always be mindful of the fact that we have greater life that's waiting us. And all we have to do is allow your word to work in and through us to produce in us what you've designed it to produce. Uh, and it's all to your glory. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> So as we look here, the question, so I'm going to title, I'm going to title this message, Is Grace Enough? Now, is grace enough? So when you look at that question, your first answer is yes. He tells us right there, my grace is sufficient. That's enough. All right, let's move on. We, we've got that one. Let's move on. Because he says it right there. But there's a problem, right? And this all goes back to the same stuff we talked about before, right? You're going to see these things show up over and over again. No. Reckon. I did it right that time, didn't I? Y I E. I can't spell one. I'm a math teacher. I don't have to worry about spelling, right? Let me go over here. No, that's right. Y I E. So I had it right this time, not the not the last time. Yeah, well, <laughs> fortunately nobody can read that. But here's the thing. Here's what it comes down to. Is grace enough? Yeah, I know it is. Let's move on. But what's the problem? Do you actually believe that it is? I want you to think about that. Do you believe that grace is enough? Do you, by wisdom, allow grace to be put on display in your life? That's the yield part, right? Now we know my grace is sufficient for thee. Jesus Christ, right? If you got a red letter Bible, which I don't, but if you got a red letter Bible, what's those words? They're in what? They're in red. So who's speaking there? Jesus Christ, right? Now, <clears throat> we can go into a whole bunch of stuff with that stuff, but here's the thing. Notice, Jesus Christ is talking to Paul, and he says what? My grace is sufficient for thee. By the way, Stop and think about this for a second, because I just, you know, you think about these things. Where is Paul when Jesus Christ is telling him this? He's caught up to the third heaven. Isn't that what he says? In chapter 12? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Verse 4, he says how that he was caught up into, into, the, into paradise, right? Into the third heaven. He talks about that. So when, when, I, when I see this, in my mind, the way I'm reading this would be, Paul's up in the third heaven and he's talking to Jesus Christ and he says, I'm going I'm to ask you three times to take this thorn in the flesh away. All right? Why would he have a thorn in the flesh when he was in the third heaven? No, it's because, because he, knows, he knows what he's doing down on earth. He had it on He had it there. The people were going against him there. They just killed him, right? Okay. <laughs> His thorn in the flesh just murdered him. Stoned okay. him to death. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> And he knows he's going to have to go back, right? Now, I don't know if I would be able to say, yeah, he's in the third heaven or this is after he's come back down or whatever you want to do, but I'm just thinking, you know, in the context here, he's talking about being caught up into the third heaven, right, into paradise. 
And one of the things he says to Jesus Christ, he says, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And Jesus said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. Is it? Is His grace all that God is able to do because of the cross work of Jesus Christ, because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, is, is that grace enough for you? In your struggles and strife and life, is grace enough? Do we actually believe it? Do we actually count it to be true for ourselves? Do we actually live like grace is enough? So as we go down through here, this is one of those things to think about, right? And here's, here's, what, ha here's what happens. Go over to Titus chapter 2. All right? On your way... <clears throat> On your way, stop at Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> Technically chapter 2. So get Titus chapter 2 and get Philippians chapter 2. No, I know, but I was thinking the verses right before it, but it's chapter 2 verse 1. Yeah, Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Now, in, in chapter 2, remember, we're coming off the fact that he's talking about, in verse 28 and 29 and 30, he's talking about, guys, you're going to go through problems, right? He says in verse 20, 1, verse 29, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Now, we've talked about that before. There are troubles that we go through that are because we make bad decisions. There are things that we go through that are just because we live in a sin-cursed world. Remember, we talked about those a couple weeks ago. But there are certain things that if we suffer with Him, which we're going to, that's already part of who we are. We suffer with Him, right? Right? <clears throat> verse 1 of chapter 2 notice he says if there be therefore any consolation in Christ All right so he's saying if there's any consolation in Christ if any comfort of love if any fellowship of the spirit if any bowels and mercies fulfill ye my joy that ye be like minded All right he says, if you want to find consolation, if you want to find comfort of love, if you want to find fellowship of the Spirit, if you want to find bowels and mercies, notice what he says, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. How do you do that, Paul? Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Do you know what grace allows you to do? To put other people before you. Do you know what our world does now? Is put themselves before others. I deserve this. I deserve that. I get this. You, you owe me this. The majority of the stuff that we see out in the world right now is a is the basis of the exact opposite thought process that Paul is saying here. How do you find consolation? How do you find comfort of love? How do you find fellowship of the Spirit and the bowels and mercies is how? By esteeming others better than yourself. Take care and worry more about other people than yourself. Do you know that third part? The discredit and discourage part? Can you be discouraged if all you care about is other people? <laughs> no. Try it. Try it out once. Care more about the person next to you or the person next door or the person you work with more than you care about yourself and try to be discouraged. It's hard to be depressed when you care about other people. 
but if we're stuck on ourselves and worrying about ourselves and wallowing on our own junk, you're never going to get out of it. So then, when you look at those things, when, when, when you're attacked or when troubles come and things like that, you know how you find consolation? Have this same mind that what? Esteem others better than yourself. Look not every man on his own things, verse 4 says, but every man also on the things of others. Then he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Think about this. <clears throat> Jesus Christ goes to the cross. Did he go there for himself? No. no. Why did he go to the cross? Because he esteemed you better than himself. Bruce, he, he esteemed you better than himself. He esteemed me better than himself. And whoever's watching, he esteemed you better than himself. And he says, that's the same mindset that we should have. How do we do that? By knowing that his grace is enough. His greatest point of weakness that Jesus Christ ever experienced as man was the cross. And what do we know about weakness? What's made perfect? His strength. He says, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now you think about that. Go over to uh, Titus chapter 2. Here's the issue. Grace is only as, en as enough as you allow it to be. I tell my kids at school all the time, I will help you in math as much as you allow me to help you. Okay? If you don't show up, of course, tomorrow we're starting with the hybrid, so half the kids will be there Monday and Tuesday, the other half will be there Thursday and Friday, deep clean day on Wednesday, so next week's going to be a mess. Um, I'm going to try my best to be awake for Wednesday night. But if I'm dead asleep, I'm going to apologize if I can't do Wednesday night. But I'm going to try my best to do it because I want to keep that going. But, <clears throat> and I tell my kids, if you don't show up to class, if you don't take notes, if you don't practice the homework, you're not going to learn this stuff. And if you come to me and say, what can I do to get my grade up? Well, did you watch the videos? No. Did you take your notes? No. Did you work on the homework? No. I can't help you. I'm not going to help you. That's what grace is. Grace is only enough if you allow it to be. You ever thought about that? Here, here's the thing. <clears throat> Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Here's how all this stuff kind of goes together here. Notice. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. We've gone through these verses, right? We talked about the first 10 verses of chapter, of chapter 2 in Titus. Paul says, here are some things that, that should become sound doctrine. When aged men, aged women, young women, young men, servants, when you all are in the local assembly doing what you're supposed to do, he says that should be becoming to the sound doctrine that you have stored up in you. And here's how it's accomplished, not in your own flesh, not in your own work, not in your own tries, but verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live what? Soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. And purifying himself a peculiar people, zealous of what? Is God's grace opposed to good works? Absolutely not. No. You go over to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, which everybody knows 8 and 9, but verse 10 says what? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should what? Walk in them. Grace doesn't exclude good works. Grace says, I'm going to do the good works for you. Just get out of my way and let my word work. 
And that's exactly what it does. And it glorifies God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and more importantly, I wouldn't say more importantly, but the book. It says that book, the Bible that you have, is the most important thing that you have in this world right now today. Because that's your only connection to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the only thing that's going to teach you about what grace is. And again, it comes down to, yeah, I know His grace is sufficient, but do you actually believe it? And if you actually believe it, have you actually yielded to it? Or are you still trying to do things in your own flesh? Or are you saying, well, I've got it. I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. What's going to, be, what's going to happen is grace produces good works, right? Good works don't produce grace. Grace produces good works, right? And that's the thing that, that we've got to know and understand. But again, it's only as effective in our life. It's only enough in our life that we allow it to. Um, I want you to go real quick. Go to Romans chapter 5. We're going to spend a little bit of time in Romans chapter 5 and 1 Thessalonians and some other passages because there's some things here that's really quite interesting. <clears throat> Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Now, remember, Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3 tells us what? Gentile, you're under sin. Jew, you're under sin. No matter how good you think you are, no matter how great you think you are, no matter how strong you are, no matter how weak you are, no matter how good you think you've done, guess what? You're under sin, right? It's a bad place to find yourself. By the way, if you're not sure about that, here's the law, go keep it. You can't keep it, right? You just prove yourself that you're under sin. You can't do it yourself. Then he says in Romans chapter 3, verse 21, he starts talking about the righteousness of God that's being revealed. And he says, here's how you get the righteousness is by faith of Jesus Christ. By the way, the faith of Christ is a very important doctrine that we all need to know and understand. And we don't allow people to come along and say, well, no, that should be faith in Christ. You've got grace people that even do that. So be careful with those guys. And they want to change it to something other than faith of Christ because they're afraid that when they say faith of Christ, they're going to diminish his deity in some way, and that's not possible. That's what he said. I know. But it really means faith in Christ. All right, keep telling people not to trust your King James Bible. Anyway, I'm off that soapbox. Here's the thing. When we go through that, all right, we keep those things in mind. Romans chapter 3 starts talking about, hey, here's my righteousness, and the way that you're going to get my righteousness is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The fact that he went to the cross, was buried, and rose again the third day. That's an important truth for us to know and understand. Then you get over to Romans chapter 4, and he says, by the way, I'm going to give you, I'm going to justify you, I'm going to declare you righteous by faith, and that alone and he says the same way that, I, that, that Abraham and that David talks about. And he says, no, not only am I going to impute that to you, I'm not going to impute your sins to you. You know how great that is? It's pretty darn good. Not only am I going to give you my righteousness, impute that to you, but all the junk that you do in your life after you get saved, he says, I'm not going to impute that to you either because it's already taken care of. That's the whole idea of it being buried. He took all your sins away. And he took them to the cross. You know why, it's e you know why it should be easy for us to forgive others? Take it to the cross. Take it to the cross. Quit trying to hold that over yourself and other people. Because you're just putting yourself in it. Most of the time, people that you're mad against, and mad at, and upset with, and not forgiven, they don't even know that they've done something wrong to you. <laughs> so take it to the cross that's all you can do take it to the cross and forget about it that's what God did then you get over to chapter 5 and this is where we or this is where we find ourselves in chapter 5 he says in verse 1 therefore based upon the, all the things that I just got through talking to you about being justified by faith notice we have peace with God 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, by whom also, talking about Jesus Christ, not only do we have peace with God, but notice, also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Now I want you to think about this. <clears throat> That's where you stand, right? All that God's free and capable and able to do for you through the Son. He says, everything I've made you, everything that I've named you, everything that I've, I've given you, that's what my grace is. And he says, how do I, how do I get that grace to live in my life? faith the only thing that grace accepts is faith right so faith is how we access that grace where God says here's who you are in my son do you believe it you read the verse yeah I know I know I know that I have peace with God do you I know that I, I have access to this grace by faith. Do you? Now, as we've gone through Titus, Titus chapter 2 starts digging into your home life and your, your life period, right? Yeah. And you start thinking, you know, I don't know if I really like this grace stuff anymore. It was good when I just knew that I'll have to go and be baptized and tithe and all that stuff. But now you're telling me that, you know, it's actually going to live in my life. I don't know if I like that. Do you know what grace does? Grace puts you on the spot. But here's the thing. Is that position that you have, is that enough in your life to get you through life? Or are you still trying to do it yourself? And that goes back to the prayer thing, right? So let's take a look at this. <clears throat> Go over to 1 Thessalonians. <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is a verse that we've looked at quite a few times. <clears throat> But I want, us to, I want us to be able to look at some things here. How is it that you access the grace that's enough? By faith. By faith. All right. What's faith mean? Believing God at His word. Believe, taking God at His word. What does that mean? Believing that this is true. Okay. What does that mean? You got to read. What does that mean? All right. So Bruce talked about that for the verse for next week. What does that mean to take God at his word? Okay. What does it mean to trust God's word? Notice. I don't know. Well, no. Here's the thing. First Thessalonians chapter two. All right. Challenging me too much this morning. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Actually, let's start off in verse 12. Notice, 1 Thessalonians 2, 12. And I know we're cutting into the context here, and we'll get that. But notice, he says, That we should walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. All right, now we can talk about that called, and we'll talk about some other stuff a little bit later on. But notice verse 13. For this cause... Also thank we God, notice, without ceasing. You know what Paul's doing there? He's thanking God. What's that from? Prayer. Mm -hmm. Right? He says, also thank we God without ceasing because, I want you to notice this, when ye received 
the Word of God. What's it mean to receive, to have received the Word of God? All right. Notice, hold your place there. Go over to 1 Corinthians 15. <clears throat> Hold your place there in 1 Thessalonians 2. We'll come back. 1 Corinthians 15. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15. You're just throwing out stuff, man. You're getting there, though. All right. All right. All right. Uh, notice, and this is this is one of those things, that, you know, you just kind of put in the back of your head, and then one day something kind of clicks. Notice 15 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have what? Received, and wherein ye what? Do you know what he's telling them? Guys, here's the gospel. Remember, you've already received it, which means what? They've had to have heard it, and they've had to have trusted it, right? They have taken the truth of the death, burial, and resurrection, and they have believed it to be true for themselves. They've reckoned it to be true for themselves, right? They've not just, yeah, I know it, but they've actually received it. They've taken um, hold of it. Does that make sense? They've taken it to be true for themselves. Notice, he says, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also, what? Received. How that Christ died for, my, for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Do you know what Paul's telling them right there? You've received it, but I've also received it. I heard it, and I took, took ownership of it. This is my gospel, right? He says, I believe it too. I have taken and I've heard that and I've placed my faith and my trust in what God said, what Jesus Christ said at that time. And he says what? Where, which also I received. So Paul is saying, this is something that I've also believed. And that's where, that's what I'm, just go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the operation of it, right? <clears throat> you know, everybody goes around and says, well, you just got to have faith. What does that mean? When they say that, what's that mean? You've got to do something just enough so God will... Yeah, you've got to do you. just enough to know right. that God actually believes that you're right. in your heart. You really, No. Just enough amount good. Yeah. How do you know you've not done enough? How do you know you did too much? No. How do you know if you did too little? How do you know when you've done the right, the right, the right amount of thing? But notice, chapter 2, verse 13, he says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God. All right? So this, this idea is they've what? They've taken ownership of it. They've accepted it. They've embraced it. They've entertained it. They've believed it. Right? The idea here is, They've reckoned it to be true for themselves. Do we see that? They heard it. They know what's going on, but they've actually believed and they've received it. This is true for me. I don't know about you, but it's true for me. All right? Keep on going. When ye receive the word of God, which ye what? Heard of us, which means what? Romans ten seventeen. right? Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How do you access the grace if you is by faith? Can you access this position if you don't know the position exists? No. no. Here's the thing. The moment you get saved, that's your position. But if you're not told about that position, you can't access that position. Right? You can't live your life based upon that if you don't know it. If you're not taught it. 
if you don't read it for yourself. Paul says in Ephesians 3, right? Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So, getting in the book and finding out. Notice he says, which ye heard of us, ye received it, you, you trusted it, you took hold of it, not because it's from somebody else, but notice what he says, ye received it, not as the word of men, but it as it is in truth, the what? The word of God. Which what? Which effect, effectually worketh also in you that what? When you, by faith, access the information of who you are in Christ, then what's going to happen? He says it's going to do what? Which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now I want you to think about that word effectual. What's that mean? Effectual is it's going to produce the intended effect that God's put on it. That's different from effectively. Effectively has to do with uh, uh, um, powerfully, like some real operation. When you're talking about effectually, he's saying, are we off? Could be your phone. Okay. Is it green on there? Okay. So when he's talking about effectually, it's... It's going to produce, what was the verse that we had a couple weeks ago? Isaiah 55, 11? Isn't that what the one you had, Delilah? Isaiah 55, 11? That the Word of God will perform exactly what He set it out to do. The Word of God will not come back to Him void, but it will accomplish that what He sets forth. There is an effect that God's Word has on you that it will produce that effect in you when you actually believe it. What's that effect? That's that Titus 2, right? It's going to produce in you a life that is what? That makes it possible for you to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. To live based upon what His Word actually says when we actually allow the Word to produce in us what God's designed it to produce. Uh, go over to chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And we'll see these things. Man. We've not really gotten much anywhere yet, have we? And it's almost 12.30. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5. Notice it says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much, much assurance. As ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. That's going to tie back to something that we see over in chapter 2, verse 10, where Paul says, you, you, you remember, you all were witnesses. God's, God was a witness also how holily, how holily, uh, I messed that up. Chapter 2, verse 10. You are witnesses and God also how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. And that's what he's saying here, right? For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. You saw how we acted. You all saw what God's word produced in us. You saw it on display. That's not something that we could have done in and of ourselves. But that is God's word working in and through us to produce that life for us. He says, you all saw what manner of men we were among you. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word. Right? There it is again. They believed that word. In much affliction, with joy in the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Think about that real quick. They received the word in much affliction. How? With joy. 
instead of instead of us being down here thinking woe is me you know life just can't get any worse can it 2020 can't get worse all right everybody's like well 2018 was horrible well 2019 is going to be better and it wasn't and everybody said well 2019 was bad so 2020 is going to get better it's not things aren't going to get better the degeneration of man is going to produce worse and worse. Paul tells us things are going to wax worse and worse the closer we get to the end of the times, right? Spe specifically the end of the dispensation of grace. We know that. So we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be shocked when the world gets worse. <clears throat> but what does he say we should do? They received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. So that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. Can you imagine? Could you imagine the things that they had going on in, in their life? And of course, we can go back to chapter two or chapter one, verse two, three, and four. We'll take a look at that next time. They had what? Faith, love, hope working in their in their congregation. And he said, "You all are the model church that people in all the people in in Macedonia and Achaia." They know about your church. Not just then, but he says, in every place, your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. Paul goes in some place and like, man, Paul, are you the one responsible for giving the word to the people up in Colossae? Because I've heard what they're doing up there and they're, they're, they're doing it, brother. No matter where he went, everywhere he went, he said, people knew about you. He says, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. You take a look at those things. You start thinking about what's going on there and you get to see God's word working through them that they they turned from their what? They turned to God from idols and to the and served the living and true God. Now that word serve there, we're going to take a look at that a little bit later on too, because if you look at if you look at verse four, we're going to look at these a little bit more as we go through, but verse four it says, Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. What does election always have to do with in Scripture? It's not salvation. Any of that stuff is about service, right? And he says, you, you all know the, your election to God. That's why we see you over here serving the living and true God. Now, I really hate to quit, but it's been over a half hour. Anyway. More than that, actually. Probably about 45 minutes. Huh? You got four minutes left? Bruce, you know I can't do four minutes. And four minutes becomes 14. But here's what I want you to think about. In, in, in this next week, think about this question. Is grace enough? Whatever situation you come up in this, this week, think, is grace enough? Now, I'm going to tell you, the week that I'm anticipating coming up with, with school, I'm going to be asking that question a lot. And, you and the best part is, you already know the answer. But, are we counting it true for ourselves that it is actually enough? And are we going to live like it actually is enough? Can we say with Paul, I'd rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 
Now, there's, there's a verse we're going to go take a look at probably next week. I don't know. Hopefully next week. Um, that'll let us see where your strength is. And we'll take a look at that <coughs> next time. All right? So we're going to stop there. We'll pick back up. There, there's a lot. Like this part, the consolation stuff is what I've been really looking forward to getting to. So the, all the stuff we talked about so far, the sufferings and all that stuff, and just know it's coming. I mean, in some form or fashion. Um, but how do we respond to it? By faith in what God's Word says, right? So <clears throat> um, I'm going to stop there. I still have two minutes, but that's all right. I'll go ahead and stop real quick. Um, folks online, we, again, we greatly appreciate you all joining us. Everybody that's here, we greatly appreciate you all joining us as well. Um, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please let us know. Uh, also, again, uh, let us know if you have any prayer requests. Um, please make those known to us. Uh, we can't, we can't, if I don't know, I can't help you. If I don't know what's going on in life, I can't do anything to help you out. So let us know. Um, one I do know is um, uh, Tyler's been sick here lately. So uh, keep him and, and Mike and Renee in your own thoughts and prayers. Um, they did tell us that, what, uh, Wednesday night? So keep them, keep them in your prayers. He's been dealing with different types of sicknesses and pneumonias pretty much all year. So, you know. They kind of hate to get out because of his immune system is really bad. So uh, keep them, keep them in your prayers. And um, I think that's about it. Uh, but if you all have anything, just let us know, and uh, we'll do that. And also, if you got a verse you want us to put up, let us know, and we'll do those things. Okay. So. <clears throat> all right, there, I did. I killed two minutes. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word, that you've preserved it throughout the years and ages, that we, by simple faith, by placing our faith and trust in what your word says, it will produce exactly what you've designed it to produce in our lives, that we might be to the praise and honor and glory of your grace. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.